Okay. There we go. And ba, 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 very good, very good. We should now be recording our lesson, which is fantastic. Again, just a couple quick reminders. Welcome first, good morning. Make sure you sign in for attendance on Google Classroom. There's a quick little Google form to fill out. If you have any questions while we're going through this, please feel free to unmute your microphone and just ask, just interrupt me, that's fine. If you don't feel comfortable speaking, then you can type it in the chat and I'll get to that when I get to that. Make sure that your microphone stay muted though through the duration of this. It just helps minimize distractions and that your webcams are disabled as well. So without any further ado, let's jump into Algebra 2. Just because we're doing it from afar doesn't mean we can't get our math on. So uh, what I'd like to do with you today is I'd really just like to go over the problems that I asked you to complete for the start of today's class. It's really just a review of what we talked about while we were still in, uh, in school before this distance learning stuff started. I'd like to go through with you uh, an example of a square root graph, an example of a cube root graph, as well as two equations to solve, one that involves some distribution and one that doesn't. So I think that would be a nice little recap of everything we've done so far. Again, if you have a question, just feel free to speak up. So let's get started here. Uh, in another tab, if you want to go ahead and open that day one assignment that I gave you for the graphing square roots and solve uh, graphing square roots and cube roots and solving equations with square roots and cube roots, you can go ahead and do that so you can follow along. But again, I'm just going to go through a couple examples with you now. So starting with something like problem number one, I think problem number one is a nice basic square root graph, just shows all the fundamentals of exactly what you need to know. We have the function looks like this. We have uh, f of x is equal to negative 2 times the square root of x plus 5 and then plus 3. Okay, So that's the function that we have to work with. Um, sounds good. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, so we have that function right there and we're going to try to sketch a graph. So when we graph a square root function, you must remember it's all about, in a cube root function, it's all about goals. So we're trying to establish goals of values that I'd like to plug in so that I'm not dealing with decimals or fractions or making my life unnecessarily harder. The first goal that I'd like to shoot for is the square root of zero because if I can plug in some number that allows me to take the square root of zero here, oh, hold on, let me set my uh, focus lock, that allows me to set take the square root of zero here, it would just make my life a lot easier. So the value that's going to make that happen is negative five. That would be a great starting value to pick because negative 5 plus 5 is 0, the square root of 0 is 0, times negative 2 is still 0, plus 3 is 3. So our starting point for this square root graph would be at negative 5 comma 3, and we're actually going to use that starting point in just a little bit to determine our transformations. From there, I'd like to find a value that allows me to take the square root of 1. Hopefully you can see here that negative 4 is exactly that value because negative 4 plus 5 would be 1. The square root of 1 is 1 times negative 2 is negative 2 plus 3 is positive 1. So our next point would be at negative 4 comma positive 1. From there, I'd like to take the square root of 4 because that's my next perfect square. Why work with fraction and decimals if I don't have to? Uh, the value that's going to allow that to occur, I believe, is negative 1, right? Because, look, negative 1 plus 5 is positive 4. The square root of 4, you'd be like, ooh, that's an easy thing that I can do. The square root of 4 is 2 times negative 2 is negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. And then last but most certainly not least, I'm looking to take the square root of 9. What value should I plug in to take the square root of 9? Well, that's just 4 because 4 plus 5 is 9. The square root of 9 is 3 times negative 2 is negative 6 plus 3 is negative 3. So now we have some great points that we can go ahead and plot to sketch a graph of this type of thing. So I'm being mindful of where my things are positioned because it makes a lot of sense to leave a lot of room on this side so I don't run out of space here. So I'm drawing my coordinate plane. My starting point is negative 5 comma 3 right here. We then have another point at negative 4 comma 1, another point at negative 1, negative 1, and one final point at 1, 2, 3, 4 comma negative 1, 2, 3. And you should see that when we link all those points together, it makes our nice smooth square root curve. Hopefully everybody understands that on my on the coordinate plane. I, again, that's sort of a standard graphing square root example that we've talked about in class a couple times. So once we now have that, we can now talk about other things related to that graph, namely the transformations 
as well as the domain and range of that graph. So the transformations just refer to how is this function different from the parent function. The parent function is just the regular old square root of x, which really just looks like this. So we're trying to ask, how is this function that we just drew different from this regular old parent function? Well, the big difference is the starting point. Instead of starting at 0, 0, we're actually starting, our horizontal shift is to move to negative 5. So I would start by saying we moved left 5 units. We also traveled, instead of starting at 0, 0, we traveled up 3 units. Instead of having a stretch of 1, we now have a stretch of 2. So that means that your graph is increasing, or in this case, actually decreasing twice as quickly. And since it is a negative, we can say that it is reflected over the x-axis. That just means that it's flipped upside down. So I'd say that this is reflected over the x-axis. And that's exactly what I would write for my transformations. We had a great question last class, uh, my A1 class, they asked, could I say instead of left five, could I say it has a horizontal shift of negative five? Instead of up three, could I say it has a vertical shift of positive three? Absolutely, that's another great way to communicate this. As long as you can communicate to me how that function moves around, that's totally fine. The other pieces of this function are its domain and its range, very important. So the domain of this function, again, that's the space that the graph occupies from left to right. The furthest to the left it goes is negative 5, and then it continues to the right forever. So I would say my domain is negative 5 to infinity. My range, same deal, but we're just talking vertically now. It goes down forever, so I'd say we go down to negative infinity. But we don't go up forever, we only go up to positive 3, and so that would be our range. All right? Again, if anybody has any questions during this, just please feel free to interrupt via voice chat or uh, text chat. Either way is totally fine with me, but that's exactly what we're looking at. So hopefully that should make sense. Moving into a cube root graph. So I'm just gonna do number two on the review because again, that's a pretty standard cube root graph. Uh, it looks like this. We have f of x is equal to the cube root of 2x minus one minus four. Cube root graphs and square root graphs share a lot of similarities. Just like with the square root graph, they are also all about establishing these goals and going from there. In a cube root graph, however, we don't have a starting point and extending in one direction. That's how a square root graph looks. With a cube root graph, we have a center point and we extend in both directions. So looking at our cube root graph, I'd like to start try by finding what value allows me to take the cube root of zero. The value in this case that allows me to take the cube root of zero on the inside is one half because two times one half would be one minus one would make zero now you may think to yourself like maybe i can't figure that out off the top of my head how the heck am i supposed to see that it's one half well remember you could always fall back to this strategy of making a little equation and saying well when is 2x minus one equal to zero what value does that occur at i can add one to both sides i can say 2x is equal to one divide by two you get x equals one half so you always have that fallback strategy to use if you need to. So I'd look here and I'd say, well, if I plug in 1 half, this middle part is going to be 0. The cube root of 0 is 0. Minus 4 is negative 4. Okay? And something to keep in mind, just like up here with my square root graph, that starting point on the square root graph and the center point on the cube root graph are exactly what you use to determine your transformations. You use those to determine how the graph moved around. We can then extend in the positive direction, looking for the cube root of one. What value, if I plug it in, will allow me to take the cube root of one? Uh, I believe that's just one itself. Because if you notice, two times one is two, minus one goes back down to one. The cube root of one is one, minus four is negative three. Hopefully, hopefully all my mental math is good. Then we have the cube root of eight, looking to take the cube root of 8, because that's the next perfect cube. That's why I'm going for those goals, right? Don't make my life harder than it needs to be. What value should I plug into here to take the cube root of 8? I don't know. Let's figure it out. What value for x is 2x minus 1 equal to 8? I can add 1 to both sides. I got 2x is equal to 9. Divide by 2, you get x equals 9 halves, or in other words, 4.5. So you could write it as 9 halves or 4.5, whichever you prefer. 
Notice that when you take this value and plug it in, this middle part is going to come out to be eight. That's the point of picking this value of nine halves. Yes, you could work it out where you could say that multiplication by two and division by two will cancel out. And now you have nine minus one is eight. But that's why you picked this value in the first place. So I know when this goes in, you get eight. The cube root of eight is two minus four is negative two. Okay. And now I could just go ahead and extend in the negative direction. I could say we want to now get the cube root of negative one. So what value for x will allow that to occur? I believe it's just zero because two times zero is zero minus one is negative one. The cube root of negative one is itself. Minus four is negative five. And last but not least, I forgot to label up here. Last but not least, we're looking to take the cube root of negative 8. So what value should I plug in for x to get that? That's another tough one to see off the top of your head, but just a little equation can clean that up really fast. I'm trying to find out when is 2x minus 1 equal to negative 8. I can add 1 to both sides to get 2x is equal to negative 7. Divide by 2, you get x equals negative 7 halves. Or in other words, negative 3.5. So if we plug in negative 7 halves for x, you know that this middle part is going to come out to be 8. The cube root of 8 is 2 minus 4 is, oh, sorry, the, it's my fault. The, that's why I'm getting confused. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2 minus 4 is negative 6. Very good. And so now I can just go ahead and sketch those points on a coordinate plane. It looks like all my y values, if you notice, are below the uh, x-axis. So that's why I'm going to kind of sketch my graph with a lot of space down here. So it looks like we have our center point at one half right here, comma negative one, two, three, four. We have our next point in the positive direction at one comma negative three. We have 4.5 comma negative two, one, two, three, four and a half comma negative two right there. Moving now in the negative direction, we have zero comma negative five right there. And we have negative 3.5, 1, 2, 3, and a half, comma, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And if you notice, it makes that nice S-shape cube root structure that we talked about in class. And there we go. There's a nice graph of the that cube root function. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, a couple things that we can, again, extract from that are the transformations, domain, and range. I'll do them right down in this little space here. So talking about the transformations of this function, uh, we're looking at, again, how is this different from the regular parent function, which starts at the origin? Well, we moved here right by half a unit, because again, we're looking at that center point. We also moved down four units. We have a stretch of one. That's the same as the parent function, so it's not necessary to note that there is a stretch of one, but just for consistency sake, you can certainly say that there is a stretch of one if you so desire. And it's not negative, so we don't have to indicate anything about being reflected over the x-axis, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Domain and range should be a snap though with this cube root stuff because we know that the domain and range of any cube root function is always all real numbers. Always, 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 100% of the time, because it's always going to extend up and down forever, and it's always going to extend to the left and right forever. Excellent. So that should be a pretty comprehensive review on everything we talked about graphing-wise. Any questions, comments, concerns about that? Again, please feel free to just ask in the chat or unmute yourself and speak up. Feel free. So now transitioning from that, we're going to move on to solving equations, which is great. We have about 15 minutes left, so perfect. About half the class on graphing, half the class on, sol on solving. Uh, going back to the assignment, I think, again, I'm just going to go with problems four and five. The first two solving problems should give us a nice overview of exactly what we talked about before. So problem number four is what I would consider to be a quote unquote easier solving equation problem because it really just involves some algebra one skills. So if I look at something like problem number four, right? Problem number four is the cube root of three X plus four should equal the cube root of nine X minus 38. And we're looking for the value of x that satisfies that, some classic solve for x style algebra. So what I would do on both sides is I'd like to get to that x, but right now that x is trapped underneath that q root. 
So to get rid of that, I'd like to raise both sides to the third power or cube both sides because that will cause the cube and cube root to cancel out. That now gives me 3x plus 4 is equal to 9x minus 38. And now we've just arrived in Algebra 1 territory where we can isolate the variables, isolate the constants, and then solve. So I'm going to subtract 9x on both sides to move the variables to the uh, left side. I'm going to subtract 4 to move the constant to the right side. I have negative 6x is equal to negative 42, it looks like. Divide both sides by negative 6, and you get x is equal to 7. Or is it? That is the million-dollar question. Because remember, we still have to check for extraneous solutions. And that is a really important thing when dealing with radical functions and equations, is that extraneous solutions can pop up, so we have to just be mindful of that. Is it true that when x is equal to 7, let's check for x equals 7, is it true that the cube root of... 3 times 7 plus 4 is equal to the cube root of 9 times 7 minus 38. Is that a true statement? Well, let's find out. We get 3 times 7 is 21 plus 4 is 25. I get the cube root of 25. Is that equal to, let's see, 9 times 7 is 63 minus 38. We also get the cube root of 25. And the cube root of 25 is, in fact, equal to itself. Even though it comes out to a decimal, we can clearly see that the cube root of 25 would equal itself. So therefore, this is a valid solution. Cool. Does anyone have a question, comment, concern about that? Again, unmute, ask, type it in the chat. Don't feel like you're interrupting. I'm here to help you. So just feel free to chime in if you need to. But hopefully doing A-OK. -okay. So now moving on to problem number five. Problem number five is now what I would consider to be, so that, that's what I'd call like an easier difficulty problem. Problem number five is what I would now call somewhat of an intermediate level problem. So looking at problem number five, it states that the square root of 2x plus 41 should equal x plus 3. Just like that. All right. So... What's the deal with this problem? What, what, what makes it harder is the fact that we have an x under the radical and an x outside of the radical. So the fact that I see an x underneath and an x on the outside, that's tricky because I need to get rid of that radical to get to the x. But at the same time, I need to, uh, I may have to do a little bit of dis distribution with this guy over here. So our very first step when dealing with problems like this should be to isolate the radical. In other words, if there are any constants or variables stuck next to the radical over here, we'd want to get them over to the other side. Conveniently enough for us in this problem, the radical is already isolated, so there's not really any work to do there. I would now just go ahead and square both sides to get rid of that square root because on the left side, the square and square root will cancel out, giving me 2x plus 41 but now, how do you do something like x plus 3 squared? And this is where friendships can potentially be broken because it is <laughs> very easy. It's a very easy mistake. I make it sometimes to say that x plus 3 squared is x squared plus 9, which it absolutely is not. How do you square something? You just multiply it by itself. x plus 3 squared is x plus 3 times x plus 3. And now we just do a little bit of first outer and our last, the distributive property on that right side. I now have 2x plus 41 is equal to x squared. We get plus 3x plus 3x from the outer and inner multiplication. So that's plus 6x plus 9. Now you see that x squared show up. And that should be like an alarm in your head to say, ooh, well, when x squared shows up, I need to factor. I have to factor, right? Have to set up for factoring. But in order to factor, we need to first set equal to 0. So I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to move the 2x over to this side. I'm also going to move that 41 over to this side. And I now get that 0 is equal to x squared plus 4x minus 32. Okay. Now that's definitely an expression that we can go ahead and factor. Just a quick little refresher on factoring. In order to multiply to equal x squared, I need an x and an x. Since we're multiplying to a negative number, that means we need one of each sign, one positive and one negative. And in order to get four in the middle, I'm looking for some combination of integers that will multiply to be this negative 32 and add to be that positive four. You could figure that out as positive eight and negative four. 
So that now gives us two potential solutions for this problem of x equals negative 8, because negative 8 plus 8 would be 0, and x is equal to positive 4, because 4 minus 4 would be 0. Notice that I say two potential solutions because we do still have to check to make sure that they are not extraneous. So let's first check when x is equal to negative 8. Is it true that the square root, we're going way back up to the top to plug in our negative 8. Is it true that the square root of 2 times negative 8 plus 41 is equal to negative 8 plus 3? Is that a true statement? Well, let's see. 2 times negative 8 is negative 16 plus 41 is the square root of 25. Is the square root of 25 equal to negative 8 plus 3, which is negative 5? Ugh, I don't like that. I don't like, I'm not a fan, not a fan of that. So I'd have to say that this solution of x equals negative eight is in fact extraneous. I know that's a sour note to start on, but there is still hope. And the hope is that x equals four will still work out for us. So let's find out. Is it true that when x is equal to four, that the square root of two times four plus 41 will equal 4 plus 3. Again, we're just going way back up to the top to plug in our x equals 4. Is that true? Let's find out. I think this one works. So we got the square root of 49 should equal 7. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. The square root of 49 is 7, and 7 is certainly equal to itself. So although we did have one extraneous solution, we do have one solution that works out, and that solution is x is equal to 4. Cool. So hopefully nobody has any questions on that. But again, if you do, feel free to just go ahead and chime in and ask. You can do so uh, via voice or you can do so in the chat. Totally fine, okay? Um, so the last, so that's pretty much a comprehensive review of everything we've talked about. The last couple problems on this sheet, the graphing problem involved, involved taking a little bit of a GCF and the solving problem just involved isolating that radical before you actually get started. So just to show you really fast since we have a little bit of extra time. Um, in problem number six, in order to actually solve that, it looks like this, three plus the square root of five X minus 19 is equal to X. It's gonna play out, oh, whoa, didn't mean to do that. It's gonna play out very similarly to the other problem, but I just need to isolate that radical first. So I just need to subtract three from both sides, making this five X minus 19 is equal to X minus three. And then the same process would occur as this problem above where we would Square both sides, distribute, set up to factor, and solve. Okay, on back on this side, we'll go back to the graphing side. If I am dealing with that problem number three from the assignment that I posted the other day, it looks like this. I'll just make a little room for it down here. F of x is equal to one half times the square root of 16x minus 48 minus one. And we're trying to graph that function. That's something that definitely looks really intimidating at first glance. But if you take a look a little further, you could be like, ooh, we could definitely take a greatest common factor to get started here. So I could say this is the same as 1 half times the square root of the GCF is 16 times x minus 3, and a little minus 1 at the end. Since I have the square root of 16 times x minus 3, we could split that apart and say, well, that's equivalent to one half times the square root of 16 times the square root of x minus three, and then minus one. And the advantage of doing that is you now have the square root of 16, which is equal to four. And so you could say that this is now one half times four times the square root of x minus three minus one. And suddenly this problem that seemed very scary just a little bit ago would now simplify down to one half times four, which is two times the square root of x minus three minus one. And that would be a very standard issue graphing problem. All right. Does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns on anything we've talked about today? Hopefully that should all make sense. That should be pr a pretty comprehensive review of everything we've discussed prior to our uh, distance learning environment beginning. Give it like a couple seconds to sink in. See, it's all making sense. We're all thinking about it. Processing, processing time, very important. All right, excellent. Doesn't seem like there's any questions coming in right now, but again, if you do have any, please feel free to ask. 
Uh, so I just want to give you a little bit of structure going forward in our last five minutes together. What we're going to be doing next class is going back to our equations. Since we pretty much did all the graphing stuff uh, prior to going out on this uh, distance learning environment, we are going to continue with our solving equations. Like I said, this problem at the start is what I'd consider to be a beginner level problem it, in that it only involves some Algebra 1 skills to be able to solve. This second problem is what I'd consider to be intermediate because it does involve some distribution, it involves some factoring. What I'd like to show you next class is I'd like to show you some problems that I would consider to be advanced or difficult problems when it comes to solving these square roots. It involves a couple distribution steps, certainly something that you are capable of. I actually believe I previewed it to you uh, on our last day together, but um, I, I would really want to make sure that I take a whole day to emphasize those and so you get plenty of practice time. I did post an additional assignment on uh, Classroom for the start of next class that will be on Friday. It's just another little quick recap of the graphing and solving just to make sure you're all up to speed. I don't plan on going over it at the start of next class, but if you do come in with a question or a lot of people come in and they're like, hey, could you really do problem number two? I really didn't understand it. Then absolutely, I'd be happy to do that for you. All right, but next class, like I said, I do want to talk about some of the advanced level, uh, the problems that I'd consider to be a little advanced level or a little tougher solving problems, okay? After that, we'll move into some applications or word problems on radicals. I know when I say word problems, everybody freaks out. Word problems on this stuff are not necessarily that difficult, in my opinion. They just involve manipulating a formula and plugging in. We'll have a couple days to practice that together, so that'll be great. And then from there, We'll see where this distance learning takes us. So I want to thank everybody today for their cooperation and their uh, willingness to learn. I know this is a shift in environment for a lot of you. It's, it's very different. It's not what you're used to. It's not what we're used to on the teaching end either. So thank you for being cooperative. Thank you for your attention and focus today. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. But that's pretty much all I got for you today. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Zach, for listening. Thank you, everybody, for listening. It's a great, I, I believe we had a full house today, so this is really great too that everybody decided to show up and uh, pay attention. So this is what you can expect every Algebra 2 class. It should be a fun time, all right? Uh, this video lesson will be, <laughs> will be recorded so that, again, if you need to watch it back, if you need a refresher or anything, that link will be posted on Classroom for you. But again, have a fantastic day. I will see you next class.